Mama Murdered a Podcast. We're diving into the third and final part of the Susan Cox Powell family murders. We've covered so much in these first two parts that I would, as always, highly, highly, highly suggest that you go back and listen to the first two parts in this case, or else this episode may not make a whole lot of sense to you. So, with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get it. So, last week, we left off on December 19th in 2009, and this was only 12 days after Susan had been reported missing. And Josh had just decided that he and the boys were going to move from their house in West Valley City, Utah, to Puyallup, Washington, where Josh and the kids would move in and live with Josh's dad, Steve. And this is just so strange to me, because Josh is actively choosing to uproot his kids and their entire lives to move them into his dad's house. His dad, who was completely obsessed and infatuated with Susan. And what worried husband is moving away from where the searches for his missing wife are being conducted? Because it's not like Josh is just, like, going to stay with his dad for a few weeks, like, until the media died down or something like that. No, Josh was planning to move to Puyallup, Washington for good. He had absolutely no intentions on going back to West Valley City where he and Susan lived with the kids. And even though Josh was the main suspect that West Valley City police were looking at, he wasn't under arrest, and they didn't have enough on Josh to be able to stop him from making the move to Puyallup, Washington. Now, shortly after this move, Josh was able to cash in on Susan's retirement fund since she had previously signed over the power of attorney to Josh. And I've said it a hundred times, but I'll say it again and again and again. If you want all of the details in this case, and if you want to hear all the journal entries and the audio journals that Josh and his dad Steve kept, then you have to go find the cold podcast and it just gives you so much more than I ever could. Now, as Josh and his sons Charlie and Brayden settled into life in Puyallup, Washington, Josh started regularly attending church services even though Josh had been pulling away from his religion in the past few years, and that had even kind of been the number one reason for he and Susan's arguments before her disappearance. But now all of a sudden, he's attending church services like clockwork. And it was at church that five-year-old Charlie was kind of acting out, and the women over the kids told Charlie that he would, you know, they would have to tell his mom and dad if he didn't start behaving. Charlie looked this woman dead in her face and told her that his mom was dead. And kids repeat what they hear, so Charlie wouldn't have just come up with this on his own. He had to have heard someone say that. And Susan's parents were essentially only seeing Charlie and Brayden on major holidays, even though Josh would absolutely refuse to even walk into their house when he would drop the boys off for visits during holidays. Now, shortly after moving from West Valley City to Puyallup, Josh's older sister Jennifer learned that her husband had to travel to that area for work, and Jennifer kind of came up with a plan of her own. She got in touch with Detective Ellis Maxwell, and she asked if, you know, if she would be willing to wear a wire to try to get Josh to confess to murdering Susan, like, if that was something that she could do with law enforcement's help. And of course, Detective Ellis Maxwell agrees to make this happen for Jennifer because, according to the Cold Podcast, in Washington, everyone who's being recorded has to be made aware that they're being recorded in order for that recording to be able to be used in a court case. So that meant that in order for this to work, 
Detective Ellis Maxwell had to write up a warrant for a judge to sign off on in order to even be able to wire Jennifer up to make this happen. And eventually, the warrant did go through, and it was go time. But just think about this, though, because Jennifer is Josh's blood sister, and she is so sure that her brother is responsible for what happened to Susan that she's willing to wear a wire to try to catch him without anyone else in the family knowing about the wire. Because everyone else in Josh's family were all kind of the same way. They would lie and cheat and cover up for anyone else in the family, no matter what they had done. And Jennifer, on the other hand, was like, absolutely not. Someone needs to be held responsible for this, whether it's my own brother or not. Which probably explains why Jennifer was kind of estranged from the rest of her family. So, on January 21st, Jennifer met with law enforcement and she got wired up. Jennifer was given, like, a safe word to use, just in case she felt like she was in danger, and they even had officers on standby near Steve Powell's house. Jennifer did this, like, kind of like it was a family dinner type of thing, where everyone was kind of there, hanging out, eating dinner, but every time she would get anywhere near Josh to try to talk to him and ask him anything, their dad, Steve, would kind of interrupt and pull Josh away from Jennifer, And it almost kind of sounded like on the recordings that Steve Powell maybe had a sneaking suspicion that Jennifer was trying to collect information to give to detectives. And that's just the way that Steve was acting about Jennifer being left alone with Josh for any period of time during that dinner. But Jennifer herself says on the Cold Podcast that they were all probably suspicious of her just because she didn't agree with the things that the rest of her family did and they just really weren't that close in general. So, it would be weird for Jennifer to even be at this family dinner with Josh and their dad, along with, you know, their other siblings. Jennifer does finally get Josh pulled to the side for just a few minutes, and this is when she asks where Josh had driven that 807 miles for those 18 hours when he had had that rental car. And Josh doesn't answer any of the questions that Jennifer asks. So, after asking multiple questions and Josh always claiming he doesn't know or he doesn't remember, Jennifer kind of tells Josh that he may be getting arrested soon and that if he does, she encouraged him to take a plea deal. Josh tells Jennifer that his attorney had advised him not to speak to anyone about Susan's disappearance and this is about the same time that Josh is pulled away from Jennifer by their dad, Steve. Steve told Jennifer that it was probably a good time for her and her husband to leave the house. Jennifer made a few remarks saying that Josh should enjoy his freedom while he has it. And then right before Jennifer and her husband leave the house, and this is all on recording because the cold podcast has these audio clips, but right before Jennifer and her husband left the house, Steve called Jennifer a bitch. Jennifer is Steve's daughter. So, he called his daughter a bitch, and then Jennifer made the remark that Susan hated Steve and that she was disgusted with him. And out of all of the arguments and bickering and snarky remarks that are being made in the background by everyone else, it is clear that Steve focused solely on the comment about Susan hating him and being disgusted with him. And it's just super eerie to even listen to. And for the following months and years after this, detectives were still following up every lead and searching for Susan in multiple, you know, vast areas where a body could be disposed of that were kind of in the radius of that 807 miles and 18 hours that Josh had driven around in that rental car. There were searches done in caves and different mountain locations, but not one single trace of Susan was ever found. And during this entire time, Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox, had been attempting to get some sort of custody agreement in place for Charlie and Brayden. But of course, Josh made every step of that nearly impossible. Charlie and Brayden had started attending classes at the YMCA summer program, and Charlie was five at the time and Brayden was about three. Now, during this summer program, Charlie had started making comments about his mom being dead, which... Of course, all of his teachers knew that Susan Powell was his mom and she was missing. And they also knew that Josh was his dad and also the main suspect. So, Charlie was already making, you know, weird comments during the summer program at the YMCA. But then he started kindergarten. And when he did, Josh wrote this letter to the school kind of saying who could and couldn't be around Charlie 
along with a list of people who could and couldn't pick him up from school. And I know what you're thinking, like, oh, this is just a normal emergency contact list, like a list of the two or three people that you trust and list for the school so that if you ever need someone to pick your kid up, you have a few people on this list. But this wasn't the kind of list that Josh made at all. No, instead, this letter and list kind of said that Mormons were out to get everybody in the Powell family and that even some of Charlie's blood relatives couldn't visit or be around or pick Charlie up from school. This list included Josh's sister Jennifer and Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox. But the list also included Susan, which is weird. So Josh had taken the time to write this long letter to the school about Mormons being out to destroy his family, and then made a list of people who weren't allowed to be around Charlie without his knowledge. But then Josh had also listed Susan on that list of people. That's weird. So from here, Josh had gone to court and was asking the judge for a protective order from Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox. Josh and the kids only lived a few miles from where Chuck and Judy Cox lived, but they were never allowed to see their grandsons. And since Chuck and Judy Cox weren't allowed to pick the boys up and they weren't allowed to spend the night or have playdates at their house, when Chuck and Judy were leaving the Lowe's Home Improvement store one day, someone stopped them and told them that they had just seen Josh, Charlie, and Brayden inside the store. So Chuck and Judy walked back inside the store to see if they could find Josh and the boys just so that they could, like, see the boys and, like, say hello. Now, since Chuck and Judy had walked around Lowe's to try to find Josh and the boys, Josh filed a report for harassment saying that Chuck and Judy Cox had been stalking both Charlie and Brayden along with himself, which is ridiculous. But this is what happened. Now, during this filing, Josh claimed that he was in fear that Chuck was going to kill him, which is rich coming from Josh of all people. So, essentially, Josh was saying that he thought that Chuck Cox, an elderly man, was going to try to kill him inside of a Lowe's Home Improvement store with hundreds of people around to witness it. Okay, cool, 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 cool. And you'll probably be surprised to learn that this was actually enough for a judge to grant Josh a temporary restraining order against Chuck and Judy Cox. This restraining order was only good for like 7 to 10 days, and then there would be a hearing held at court. Now, after this restraining order was granted, Chuck and Judy Cox held a honking wave in memory of Susan on August 20th, 2011. This was almost two years after Susan's disappearance. And Chuck and Judy had sat this honking wave up in a complex where a grocery store was. They had pictures of Susan sitting out, and there were big purple balloons in her remembrance. There were also news stations and reporters set up at the honking wave, you know, to air it on TV. And it was very shortly after this honking wave was set up and active that Steve Powell pulled into the same parking lot where this grocery store was located. And when he did, he headed straight over to Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox. Steve was screaming at the Coxes and telling them that they were in violation of the temporary restraining order. And all of this was caught on the news station cameras that were set up. Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy, had been trying to find a way to get the journals that Susan had kept from her childhood and into her adult, and into her adult life, but Josh absolutely refused to let her parents have her journals. Instead, though, Josh gave the journals to his own dad, Steve, who, remember, was completely obsessed and infatuated with Susan. Why is this so weird? And Steve had gone on national TV just a little while before this honking wave, claiming that he had been thinking about publishing some of Susan's journal entries for the world to read. And this just made Chuck and Judy feel like they needed to figure out a way to either get Susan's journals back, or they at least needed to figure out a way to stop Steve and Josh from being able to publish Susan's journals. So with Steve coming up and confronting Chuck and Judy Cox at this honking wave, Chuck knew that he would be able to get Steve to admit that he had Susan's journals, and then Chuck would be able to take the footage that the news stations had captured of Steve saying that he did in fact have Susan's journals, and Chuck hoped that maybe that would be enough to get a judge to kind of, like, shut down the idea that Steve could publish Susan's journals. And then once it was time for the hearing about the temporary restraining order, the hearing didn't really go as planned for either side, really, 
the judge did grant uh, anti-harassment orders for both parties, so neither Chuck and Judy Cox or Josh Powell could be within 500 feet of each other. And they also couldn't contact each other, just things like that. And the very next day after this anti-harassment order was granted, a warrant was signed so that Steve Powell's house could be searched. And there were more than 20 officers who had to help with the execution of this search warrant. And Steve wasn't even home when the police arrived to search his house. Josh, Charlie, and Brayden were home, though, along with one of Josh's other brothers and one of his sisters. Again, this was not his sister Jennifer, just to keep it clear. And I'm really trying not to use everyone's name, like every single family member, because I feel like there's already a lot of names to keep track of, so I'm trying to explain this as simply and as easily as possible for everybody to be able to remember. So, Josh's dad, Steve, wasn't home when officers showed up to execute the search warrant. Actually, he was more than four hours away on a business lunch. But, have no fear, because as soon as officers showed up and removed everyone from the house so that they could start their search... Josh called Steve immediately to tell him what was going on. And by this point, police had also been given access to put a wiretap on Josh and Steve's phone, so their phone calls were being recorded. So when Josh was calling Steve to let him know that the police were there with the search warrant, it was all recorded on a wiretap that the police had in place. Now, during this search, police found multiple, multiple, multiple computers inside of the house, just like they had found multiple, multiple, multiple computers inside of the West Valley City House where Josh and Susan lived when police had done their initial search right after her disappearance. And this is because Josh was very much into computers and making websites for literally everything, and he really truly believed that he was some sort of computer whiz, which I guess in some sense he was kind of right, because a lot of the computers that he had were so encrypted that police still haven't been able to get into them to this day. But Josh is just stupid enough that he told one of his brothers that he had lied to the police about not being able to remember the passwords for all of his computers. And of course, police were able to hear Josh admit to lying to them because they had a wiretap on his phone. So every time police had a search warrant where they would come and take Josh's computers, he would always tell them that he didn't remember his passwords because they were so long and it was just random numbers and letters. So police would collect all of Josh's computers during different search warrants and then not even be able to get into the majority of them. But what police were able to find during this search warrant of Steve Powell's house were Susan's journals, which up until this point, Josh and Steve had refused to turn her journals over to police. Now, another thing that was found during this search was a filing cabinet that was in Steve's room of the house. The top drawer of this filing cabinet in Steve's room, there were tons and tons and tons of Susan's personal items, almost like this filing cabinet was like Steve's biggest Susan fantasies all locked away for his pleasure only. As gross as that sounds, that's basically what this filing cabinet was. Now, in that filing cabinet's top drawer, police discovered things that belonged to Susan, such as one of her shirts, one of her bras, and tons of Susan's temple garments. Now, according to the Cold Podcast, temple garments are worn under your regular clothes by members of the LDS Church, and these garments symbolize the promises that were made between the person wearing the garments and God. So, these temple garments are extremely personal and even sacred pieces for someone in the LDS Church. And Steve had just, like, stolen Susan's from when she and Josh were living with him when you know, his infatuation first started. But it's even creepier to know that Josh and Susan hadn't lived with Steve for over 10 years at this point, and yet Steve still had all of these temple garments, like, tucked away and stored out of sight. There were also pictures of Josh and Susan's wedding that was found in this filing cabinet, and Steve had gone so far as to cut Josh's face out of these pictures. Along with tons of pictures of Susan... And it was very obviously pictures that Susan wasn't aware that he was taken. But that wasn't even the creepiest thing that was found, though, because the bottom drawer of Steve's, like, filing cabinet of all things Susan also had old cotton balls that Susan had used to, like, remove fingernail polish or makeup. There were bags of Susan's underwear, clippings from her hair and fingernails, And the weirdest thing of all that Steve had of Susan's were bags that were dated. 
and these dated bags held used tampons that Susan had thrown into the trash that Steve dug out, bagged up, and then dated. He truly is just a sick, sick man. Now, while police were going through the rest of Steve's room, they found multiple VHS tapes, and when police popped them in to see what was on them, they were all voyeuristic-style videos. The few videos that police did pop in to watch snippets of that day had multiple girls on them that Steve had recorded without their knowledge. Now, another one of the creepiest things that police found during this search were Steve's own journals. They found 15 notebooks with 150 pages each, all containing his deepest, darkest fantasies from over the last 10 years of him lusting over his daughter-in-law, Susan. This search lasted hours upon hours, and it probably wouldn't have taken that long if Steve's house wasn't in, like, full-blown, legit hoarder status. So, detectives were having to go through the VHS tapes and files that they had recovered from Steve's room, and while there were videos of, like, home movies and shit like that, there were also some other videos of Steve uh, pleasuring himself, of course, to Susan. According to the Cold Podcast, these videos were like Steve would play a video on one screen of Susan and then record himself masturbating to the video of Susan on the screen and he would record himself like doing the deed. There is a special place in hell for Steve Powell and I'm pretty sure I can say that conclusively. They also stumbled across some pictures of preteen girls who were either naked or partially clothed. And these girls were later learned to be some of Steve's neighbors. And Steve had been recording these 8 and 10 year old girls over a long stretch of time. It wasn't just something that Steve recorded once. He had multiple pictures that had been pulled from videos that he had taken of these girls without these girls ever even knowing that they were being watched. So they didn't know they were being watched. Uh, they damn sure didn't know they were being recorded. Again, these are children. Steve had recorded these girls taking baths and changing clothes, and he did this through his window so that he wouldn't be seen as, you know, being full-blown creepy. But I guess that'll be enough about Steve the Creep for right now. So, Josh was told by the courts that he could absolutely not publish Susan's journals for the public to read while the investigation into her disappearance was still ongoing. Which, that's even a wild thing to even have to say. But because of this, Josh then tried to go to the courts and say that Susan was abused during her childhood by her dad, Chuck Cox, and that the journal entries may shed some light into her mindset when she disappeared. So basically, Josh tried saying that by publishing Susan's journals, that it would show her state of mind before her disappearance, and maybe even explain why she just, poof, vanished into thin air. Which, if you want my opinion, that's complete bullshit. And if you don't want my opinion, then let's keep going with the facts. Because the fact is that when police started going through Steve's journals, once they were done with his video recordings, it seems like Steve was under the impression that Susan knew about the times that he was stalking her and that he thought she liked it. Which I can almost absolutely positively say that she neither knew nor liked the fact that Steve was stalking her every move when she was anywhere in his proximity. But Steve really was that delusional. Now, during these journal entries, Steve kind of picks at all of Josh's flaws, like the fact that Josh couldn't keep a job and the fact that Susan always had to be the breadwinner. And it even kind of seems like Steve doesn't really like Josh if you're going off of these journal entries alone. Or maybe he just despised Josh for having Susan, when in reality, that's all Steve ever wanted was her. But in Steve's journals, he does say that he worries about Josh hurting Susan, and Steve even wrote that Josh had fantasized that Susan was dead before. So that's a little bit telling, I feel like. Now, Detective Maxwell, who, remember, is the lead detective working Susan's case. So, Detective Ellis Maxwell sent everything that Steve Powell could be charged with to the county prosecutor in Steve's area. And they immediately started working on a child pornography case with the neighbor girls that Steve had been recording, videoing, and taking pictures of. Those girls' moms were made aware of the pictures and videos, and she was able to confirm that the girls in those pictures and videos were of her daughter, 
And finally, on September 22nd, 2011, charges were brought against Steve Powell by the prosecutor for felony voyeurism and possession of depictions of a minor engaged in sexual and explicit conduct. And finally, 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 on the day that Steve was arrested, the kids, Charlie and Brayden, were also removed from Josh's custody and also the house where Josh lived with his dad and siblings. There were multiple reasons for removing the kids from Josh's care, which I don't have time to explain every reason as to why they were removed. And even though Josh was home at the time that the kids were removed from the house, he almost refused to go outside and talk to the detectives or the social workers. So, Josh was basically just going to let the social workers take the boys with no questions, no concerns as to where they were taking Charlie or Braden or who they would be with. None of that. Josh's brother had to go inside and almost, like, make Josh go outside to talk to the detectives and the social workers. And when Charlie and Braden were being loaded up to be removed from Josh's care, Josh never asked to tell Charlie and Braden goodbye. He never asked to, like, hug or kiss or comfort his sons. Just nothing. He showed absolutely no emotion as his kids were being removed from his custody, his care, and his house. Josh seemed to be more worried about being arrested himself, and he was just like, to hell with the kids, are they taking me to jail or nah? (laughs) That seemed to be all that Josh really cared about. But Josh wasn't arrested that night. He was still a free man, and Susan nor her remains had still been found. Now, the day after Steve was arrested, Josh had two different court hearings. One was about the harassment order against Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox, and the other court hearing was about Josh trying to publish Susan's personal journals for the public to be able to read. And thank God, the judge agreed with Chuck and Judy Cox, and the journals weren't allowed to be released to the public, and the judge also made it so that Josh had to remove any snippets of Susan's journal entries, from the multiple websites that he had created. The judge even ruled that Josh couldn't even so much talk to someone about Susan's journal entries. And on top of all of that, Josh's court hearing happened to be the day after Steve was arrested, like I said. So Steve also had to show up for a hearing that same day, where he pled not guilty to all 15 charges filed against him for the child porn and, you know, whatever else. Now, according to the Cold Podcast, Josh then had to head to a family team decision-making meeting where he would get to kind of plead his case as to where he wanted his sons, Charlie and Brayden, to be placed while they weren't in his care. Josh tried to say that his kids needed protection from Chuck and Judy Cox, and he made it clear that he did not want his sons placed with anyone who was still involved with the LDS church or Mormonism in general. So, Charlie and Brayden were left with a foster family for the weekend, while Josh was interviewed about his parenting style and stuff like that. Josh was making excuses for his dad's actions, including his dad being obsessed with Susan, and that has to be a red flag. So, the following Monday, both Charlie and Brayden were given a physical examination, and it was found that no sexual abuse had occurred on either boy. The same day, Josh was able to have a supervised visitation with both of his sons. Even though Josh had fought to keep the boys away from Chuck and Judy Cox, the very next day, both Charlie and Brayden were in fact placed under the care of Chuck and Judy Cox. And even though the kids were placed with the Coxes, this was still legally considered a protective placement until it was proven that the kids weren't safe with Chuck and Judy Cox, but these kids had probably never been more safe than they were in the Cox house. So, naturally, that protective placement was eventually lifted, and the Cox's house was deemed safe for Charlie and Brayden to be able to live there until further notice, which was exactly what Chuck and Judy had hoped for. Josh did try to go to the courts and say that he would rather his kids be in foster care than in the care of Chuck and Judy Cox, which is insane. Thankfully, the judge didn't agree with this because it's always better to have your kids placed with family especially if those kids are going to be safe with said family members. So once it was decided that Chuck and Judy Cox would keep custody of Charlie and Brayden for the time being, Josh then made it very clear that he did not want his boys attending any sort of like church services whatsoever. So even as much as Susan would have hated that Charlie and Brayden weren't being able to attend church services, she also wasn't there to be able to protest this, and Josh was still their dad. So with that, 
Josh's supervised visitation times were set to take place on Sundays during the same time that Chuck and Judy Cox would normally attend church services. So Chuck and Judy would go to church while Josh had his supervised visitations with the boys. Now, through all of this, Chuck and Judy had gotten pretty close with Josh's sister, Jennifer, you know, the badass, and the plan was that Chuck and Judy would keep Charlie and Brayden, and then they would kind of work through the legal system to eventually get Jennifer to adopt Charlie and Brayden. That way, the boys would be raised by, like, loving parents who were still physically able to keep up with the boys, and that way the boys would still be able to be, like, a constant part of Chuck and Judy's life. So, Chuck and Judy had planned to keep the boys until a custody agreement could be figured out for Josh's sister, Jennifer, to be able to take full custody of the boys. And it was during this time that the state hired a forensic psychologist who had no idea who Susan or Josh Powell was, which was perfect. The state needed an unbiased exam done in order to be able to make the decision on whether or not there was a reason not to reunite the kids with Josh. Because as we all know... Reunification is always the goal unless there's like a legit reason not to, like the safety and the well-being of the kids. And there would be a slew of things that would determine whether or not the kids could or would be reunited with Josh. During these exams, over the course of several interviews and testings, the forensic psychologist was confident in saying that Josh showed traits of narcissism. Shocker, I know. And it was later decided by a judge that Josh would not be able to do overnight visits with Charlie and Brayden unless he moved out of Steve's house. So once he heard this, Josh, of course, rented a three-bedroom house. The supervised Sunday visits would be done at Josh's house, whereas before they had been done at a facility with other family members doing other supervised visitations. And then in November of 2011... The claims of negligence or, like, mistreatment of the kids by Josh were listed as unfounded, meaning that there was no evidence that Josh had mistreated or been neglectful of their care, which in turn meant that Josh would be regaining custody of his son sometime in the next month or so as long as he agreed to the following stipulations that had been laid out to him by the courts. But Detective Ellis Maxwell was hoping that he would be able to use something that he had found on Josh's computers And this was something that had been found on the computers that were taken during the very first search of the house in West Valley City, where Susan had gone missing from all those years before. Because Detective Ellis Maxwell had uncovered cartoon images depicting incest on Josh's computers. Now, Detective Ellis Maxwell also couldn't release these images to the social workers that were over Charlie and Braden's case, without a judge signing off on it and giving the go-ahead. And this is because even having those pictures is illegal, and since those records from West Valley City had been sealed, there wasn't really much he could do. So even for the detective to make copies and give to the social worker to try to use as a means to keep the boys from being reunited with Josh, even just making those copies to give to the social worker would have been illegal. So, Detective Ellis Maxwell spoke with a judge who agreed that the pictures could be given to the social worker on Josh's case, but only if the social workers were planning to give custody of the kids back to Josh. Which was a good thing, because even though Detective Ellis Maxwell knew this, the documents were still sealed. So, he couldn't even tell the social workers that he could give them stuff to use against Josh if they were planning to give custody of the kids back to him. So, the social workers had no idea and the detective couldn't tell them. And since the social worker didn't know that the detective, you know, had these pictures and couldn't give them to them, the social worker working on the reunification process in order to get the kids back under Josh's care was going to move forward. But reunification is a process, so a judge decided that in order for Josh to get Charlie and Brayden back, that they would all three need to attend counseling sessions as a part of the process for Josh to regain custody of the boys. And during these counseling sessions, it kind of came to light that Charlie and Brayden were completely different kids than what they had been while they had been in Josh's care. The kids were adjusting to life with Chuck and Judy Cox, and they were able to be more like typical kids. Like a little more each visit, they seemed more grounded, more steady you know, kids need structure. But some things that were said by the kids were pretty alarming, to say the least. 
Like, for instance, one of the boys said that their daddy had planned to kill Chuck Cox, and when Chuck asked, like, why his daddy wanted to kill him, they just, the boys just responded saying something like, well, you're not Chuck Cox, you're Grandpa. So, obviously, they had heard someone say this before, and likely they had heard it being said more than once. And then another time, one of the boys was talking about the camping trip that they had taken the night before Susan was reported missing, and one of the boys said that their mom had gone with them on the trip, but that she had ridden in the trunk. Now, sometime after all of these counseling sessions, the forensic psychologist was done with his assessment, and he made the courts aware that he thought it would be in the best interest of the kids to not be reunified with Josh, but instead he thought that two or three supervised visits a week would be the best route to take for everybody. Now, during this time, the kids were still living with the Coxes, and things seemed relatively normal until Brayden, who was at this point seven, I believe. But Chuck and Judy Cox had had to take Brayden to the emergency room twice within like a one or two week span, just because of like typical kid injuries. And I will say at that age, kids are just prone to finding ways to get hurt. Like, our youngest son broke both of his arms at one time, climbing a tree in our front yard, like... Shit happens, but Josh, oh, he was going to make sure to take pictures of every tiny thing just so he could claim that the kids were being neglected by the Coxes. There was an investigation done into the injuries, which were like a goose egg on Brayden's head from like roughhousing with his cousins, and the other injury was a little more serious, being a burn to the foot. Chuck and Judy Cox had been renovating their house to be able to add an additional room to it for Charlie and Brayden, and Chuck had had to turn the water off to the house for the contractors, so he just boiled like a big pot of hot water so that the family would still have water while the water was turned off. Chuck said that he stored the pot beside the couch in the living room where he thought that it was out of the way, but Brayden managed to climb onto the top of the pot, and when he did, the lid flipped into the hot water, taking Brayden's foot with it. But after the investigation, it was found that these injuries were in fact just accidents and that Chuck and Judy were just still trying to adjust to life with two young kids. Now, after this, Detective Ellis Maxwell was finally able to get a judge to grant the release of those incest images that had been found on Josh's computer. And even though Josh had been doing everything he was supposed to in order to regain custody of Charlie and Brayden... Those pictures were only allowed to be shown to a very select few of people that were involved in the case and in the reunification process of the kids. One of the people that these pictures were shown to was the forensic psychologist who had sent over his report saying that he thought that, you know, two or three supervised visits a week would be in the best interest for everybody. But after the forensic psychologist saw the pictures of incest, he sent another recommendation over for the file And this report said that the pictures that he had been shown that had been found on Josh's computer made it clear that Josh approved in sexual acts against adults on young children. But I guess the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Steve Powell had been arrested for child pornography after all. Now, these pictures that were found on Josh's computer were classified as cartoon incest porn, and there were more than 400 pictures on his computer. Now, a court date had been set for February 1st, 2012, and Josh likely thought that this court date would be the day that he would regain custody of Charlie and Brayden. But it turned out to be anything but that. During this court date, the cartoon incest porn was brought up, and since the pictures depicted sex acts against children by adults, Josh was then ordered to undergo a psychosexual evaluation which I had never even heard of. So, according to Google, a psychosexual evaluation is a clinical assessment that uses scientific methods to evaluate a person's psychological and sexual functioning. So, this evaluation would be able to gauge Josh's physical reaction to different sexual things, and these tests are often used on, like, child sex offenders who have gone through the reform programs And then they'll undergo this evaluation because this isn't like a lie detector test. You can't just figure out a way to trick this. This evaluation will actually show whether or not your mind and body are sexually attracted to different things that are shown to you. There is no trick to pass this evaluation. 
Now, with the order of Josh having to undergo this sexual evaluation, the judge ruled that Charlie and Brayden would stay under the custody of Chuck and Judy Cox and that Josh would still do his weekly supervised visitations at his new house with the boys. Josh's next visitation date with the kids was scheduled for Sunday, February 5th, so just four days after the last court date. This visit was on Super Bowl Sunday, and it was set for about 12 p.m., with a member of the team supervisors named Elizabeth who would join Charlie and Brayden during this visit with Josh. When Elizabeth and the boys pulled up into Josh's driveway, the kids ran towards the house and Josh stood in the doorway, telling the kids that he had a surprise for them. Elizabeth was hurrying behind the kids, but the kids had managed to run into the house and, like, past Josh. Once the kids were inside, Josh looked Elizabeth right in the eyes before he slammed the front door of the house and locked her outside. Elizabeth had never had anything like this happen to her before, so she was like knocking on the door, yelling inside, telling Josh he needed to unlock the door and let her in, this was a supervised visit, you know, things like that. And after a few seconds of getting no response from Josh and him not opening the door, Elizabeth heard cries coming from inside the house. And then she smelled what she immediately recognized as gasoline. So Elizabeth hurried back to her car to grab her cell phone to dial 911. And I'm going to try to play you the first 911 call now. Hey, I'm on a supervised visitation for a court-ordered visit. And something really weird has happened. The kids went into the house and the parent, the biological parent, whose name is Josh Powell, will not let me in the door. What should I do? What's the address? It's 8119, and I, I think it's 89th. Um, I, I don't know what the address is. Okay, that's pretty important for me to know. Um, sorry, I can't. Just a minute. Let me get in my car and see if I can, if I can find it. Um, this, nothing like this has ever happened before at um, these visitations, so I'm really... Um, shocked, and I could hear one of the kids crying, but he still wouldn't let me in. Okay, it is, uh, one, oh, just a minute, I have it here. You can't find me by GPS? Okay, so they went into the house. 
Yeah, he, okay. he shut the door right in my face. All right, now it's clear. Your last name? My name is Elizabeth Griffin Hall. Griffin Hall is hyphenated? Yes. And what's your phone number, Elizabeth? Um, this, this cell phone number is 360-990-9955. And what agency are you with? Foster Care Resource Network. And the kids have been in there by now approximately um, 10 minutes. And he knows this is a supervised visit, too. Brayden is uh, five and Charlie is seven. And the dad's last name? P-O-W-E-L-L. Two L's? Two L's at the end of Powell? Yes. His first name? His first name is Josh. Black, white, Asian, Hispanic, native? He's white. Date of birth? I don't know. He's about 39. How tall? Um, 5'10", 150 pounds. Hair color? Brown. Did you notice what he was wearing? No, I didn't notice what he was wearing. Is he alone then, or is anybody... I don't know. I couldn't get in the house. Uh. Are you in a vehicle now, or on foot? I'm in a vehicle. I'm in a Prius. On, um, a 2010 Prius. What color with is the doors locked. But he won't, he hasn't opened the door. Okay. I rang Careful. the doorbell and everything. What, what color I is begged it? him to let me in. Elizabeth, please listen to my question. What color is the Toyota Prius? Gray, dark gray. And the license number? Um, I don't know, I can look. ZMH. Zebra Mary Henry? Yes. All right, we'll have somebody look for you there. Okay, how long will it be? I don't know, ma'am. They have to respond to emergency, life-threatening situations first. The first available deputy... Well, this, is, this could be life-threatening. He went to court on Wednesday, and he, he didn't get his kids back. And this is really... I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. Okay, has he threatened the lives of the children previously? I have no idea. All right. We'll have the first available F deputy contact you. Thank you. Bye. And this is probably the most, like, frustrating 911 call I've ever listened to in my life. Firstly, how hard is it to understand that she is the supervisor of the supervised visit with Josh Powell, who has been on the news for the last, what, two or three years at this point? Come on, man, you you cannot be that detached from what's going on in the world around you. There's just no way. And then he tells her that he doesn't know how long it'll be before deputies arrive because they have to deal with life-threatening and real emergencies first. What? <laughs> he already killed his wife. Killing his kids is not that far-fetched. Anyways, so as soon as she backs her car out and parks it on the side of the road... The house literally exploded. The windows busted out and the entire house went up in smoke. And Elizabeth was pretty sure that Josh had intentionally set the house up to ignite with him and the boys both inside of it. Josh had murdered both of his sons, 7-year-old Charlie and 5-year-old Brayden. And then he took his own life. Chuck and Judy Cox were at church when Chuck was made aware of the explosion. Chuck had been contacted by somebody who saw something about the explosion on Facebook. Chuck knew how social media worked and especially how something could get so misconstrued and how the truth becomes pretty twisted when it's being shared all over social media. So Chuck had no choice but to leave church and to actually drive over to Josh's house 
where he saw that the house was completely demolished. There was nothing left but a pile of smoldering ash and debris. And this is how Chuck Cox learned that his two grandsons had been murdered. It was shortly after that that the bodies of Josh, Charlie, and Brayden were all confirmed to have been inside of the house during the time of the explosion. All three bodies were located inside of one bedroom inside the house, and when the bodies were found, there was a hatchet found laying beside of Josh's body on the ground. It was later confirmed that Josh had used the hatchet to knock both Brayden and Charlie unconscious. But the hatchet swings weren't even what the boy's cause of death was listed as. Their cause of death was determined to be smoke inhalation. So they were alive when Josh hit them in the head with a hatchet, and then they were alive when Josh ignited the explosion of the house. Josh had purchased gallons and gallons of gasoline that he had poured all over the house. It was also later learned that Josh had taken all of the boys' toys to a local Goodwill to donate them and that he had transferred all of his finances over to his youngest sister, Elena. Josh had called and left goodbye voicemails on some of his family members' phones, and if Josh was able to kill his two kids, then, like I said, I highly doubt that he would have a problem killing his wife. Detectives and everyone else have kind of come to the conclusion over the years of the course of this investigation that it's pretty likely that Josh had help disposing of Susan's body, and detectives do think that both Josh's dad, Steve, and one of Josh's brother, Michael, were the ones that helped Josh. And there are quite a few reasons that detectives think this, but it was later learned that Josh's brother, Michael, had sold his 1997 Ford Taurus on December 23rd, 2009. The car was supposedly having transmission problems and it was sold to a junkyard by Josh's brother Michael for just $100. And this was only two weeks after Susan's disappearance that Michael sold his Ford Taurus, which was his daily driver. There were a lot of different parts and such that had been sold off of the car, but the actual car was still in the junkyard, surprisingly, in September of 2011, when police showed up asking if they could bring cadaver dogs in to search the car. Which, this ended up working out so perfectly because the owner of the junkyard had no idea that this car may have been linked to Susan's disappearance, so the owner of the junkyard had actually recently submitted the proper paperwork to have the car crushed sometime in the near future. Of course, that is until detectives showed up asking questions, and the guy that owns the junkyard doesn't have a dog in this fight, and he had no idea that this car may or may not be evidence in Susan's disappearance. So, of course, he told detectives, do whatever you need to do. So, once sniffer dogs were brought in, detectives were kind of worried that the dogs might have trouble because, you know, a lot of the times, cars that are in junkyards have been involved in car accidents, And there's a good chance that a majority of the cars in junkyards probably have, like, some kind of human blood in them somewhere. But these sniffer dogs walked right past every car in that junkyard and directly to Josh's brother Michael's Ford Taurus that was sold, you know, years earlier, two weeks after Susan had been reported missing. And this junkyard was right about at the halfway point from West Valley City where Josh and Susan had been living at the time to Puyallup, Washington, where Steve lived. So, did Michael help Josh dispose of Susan's remains? And we'll probably never learn the truth. Josh's brother, Michael, later took his own life as well. This was after Josh murdered his two sons and took his life. And Steve Powell spent his time in prison and was released one year before he also passed away. So, now there's no one left who could possibly know where Susan's remains actually are, which is heartbreaking. And I'm telling y'all, this case will suck you right in and you'll want to know every single detail, which is why I keep telling you to go find the cold podcast. It's linked below. It is really that good. But I think that's all I have for you this week. We'll start a brand new case next week, and I also wanted to mention that you can sign up on Patreon to get more episodes, but also the merch link is still available, and we now have blankets, like cute throw blankets. So that's fun. If you want something from the merch store, use the link that is listed in the you know episode description of every box. I think that's all I have, y'all. Let's do it again. Same time, same place, next Wednesday. See you then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.